today I want to talk about receive the Holy Spirit. And in the coming weeks, I'll be talking more about what it means to uh, live by the Spirit, to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? How do we practically practice the presence of God in our lives? But today, we're going to talk about just the importance of this, um, why we need the Holy Spirit, and God's gift to us of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's this picture that I found as I was, I was looking for a, a really good image of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And usually what you see when you do a Google image search is like an old painting or iconog iconography or something. And it's like you're really kind of far removed from, from that idea. But I really like this image because you see both wind and fire together mixing. You know, it's, it's really what's going on. You know, the wind is spreading the fire and, and it's, it's, it's coming together and it describes, it kind of captures what happened on the day of Pentecost. And because there's no other I images of people there, you could put yourself into there and, and imagine this. So, so I, I want us to just, just see this image of what it would be like if, if, if the Spirit of God came together. And it's, I love how it's not just one element, but there's two things going on. There's fusion going on. There's, there's like the Spirit of God in our bodies, our minds is coming together. And there's something very beautiful here in this image. Um, as many of you know, uh, I, I have, I'm a big fan of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And he, he uh, said this, uh, he wrote this in his um, uh, reflection called Thoughts Upon Methodism. Uh, this is 1786. This is about 50 years after he had his first uh, encounter with the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1738 was when he uh, had this e e powerful experience with the Holy Spirit. It was a place called Aldersgate Street, and he went into a Bible study, and it was the first time he, he experienced what he later wrote down, uh, my heart was strangely warmed. Uh, and, and this is almost 50 years later, and this is what he writes in reflection of how the Methodist movement has, has, has exploded over those several decades. And he says, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline which, with which they first set out. This is towards the end of his ministry career. This is towards the end of his life, and he's writing this. And God has been doing something so amazing in his life, as well as this movement called Methodism. Lives were being transformed inside out. You know, secular historians believe that Wesley was perhaps single-handedly responsible for preventing violent uh, revolution like what was happening in France at that time. Because Wesley believed not only in the institutional church where it was really the, 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 um, the upper class and, and the elite folks who went, and those were the days in which families bought pews. And, and so unless you had money and you, didn't have, and you had prestige and you had a certain level of class, you really weren't in the church, even though everybody was born in the church and everybody was baptized in the church and everybody was labeled as Christian. But in England at that time, it, the people who couldn't qualify themselves were really not in the church. So when Wesley uh, started to do this thing called outfield preaching, he would go out of the church building and he would go to the coal mines, he would go to the cemeteries, he would go to the fields, and he would start preaching the gospel to people. Do you know what he described himself as? He one time said, I will submit myself to be more vile. It was vile to consider leaving the pulpit of a church building to preach the gospel outside of the church. He was breaking that cultural code. He was, he was breaking that protocol and it cost him his reputation at Oxford University where he was a fellow, where he was also preaching on rotation all the time. It cost him that. But he said, I will submit myself to be more vile because the gospel is so much greater than that. And so that was, you know, when he says, which they first set out, there was this spirit of how the gospel is for everyone, how the Holy Spirit is for everyone. And, and it was so important to Wesley personally because before 1738, when he experienced the Holy Spirit, the Methodist movement already existed. He was already an ordained Anglican priest. He already was practicing all the practices of Christianity very fervently, and yet he was without the power of this gospel. He was without this power of faith living. 
I love to tell the story of powerless religion in my life. You know, we can do things like missions and justice work and building the church and, 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 and attending small group and Sunday worship, and, and it can be so dry. It can become so predictable. You know, there's so many periods in my life where Christianity was just about going through the motions and making sure I get it right or I understand it right. I get the teaching right. I get the doctrines right. I do my behavior right. I do my spiritual disciplines uh, consistently. And yet, there's no power. There's no strength. There's no fervent. Uh, there's no passion. And everything becomes routine. The small group is pretty much the same thing every time. During those Sunday sermons that Daniel Park talks about the same thing every time. I think about my dad who is retiring at the end of this month and having served in the same church for 36 years. 36 years of preaching every Sunday with a few exceptions and then preaching almost every day at early morning prayer, preaching every Wednesday for their prayer meeting. I remember about 17 years ago when I first started ministry, I asked him, I said, I said, Dad, don't you run out of things to say? <laughs> you know, you're in the same church. You know, ever since I was like three years old, that's when he started the church. He was in the same church preaching, 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 preaching all the time. And he goes, visits people in their homes and preaches as well. I said, don't you run out of things to say? That? And that was when he was pastoring for 20 years in that church. It's been 16 more years since then. And you know what he said to me? He says, of course not. I'm talking about Jesus. You don't run out of things to say when you're talking about Jesus. And I really had no idea what he meant by that at that time. But I got to tell you, there's something about talking about Jesus. There's something about talking about Jesus every single day. And if there's, if there's you know, uh, if there's one thing that Pastor Isaiah and I talk about every single day, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Yeah, he's part of the family. Isn't he a part of yours? I really want to challenge you about that. You know, and I'm not talking about talking about church. We talk about church too. But talking about church doesn't mean that you're talking about Jesus. And you could talk about the programs, the lessons, the people, the ideas. You could talk about church. You could do that with your family and make that regular about what happened at church or what's going on at church. And you could still miss Jesus. You can still miss the, the, the Spirit of God working in the midst. And God really convicted me of this this past week. You know, I was praying and, and I was thinking about my own life. I was thinking about ministry. I was thinking about the sermon. And, and the question came to my mind, what are we doing as Christians? What, are, what am I doing as a believer in Jesus Christ? What am I doing as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because he's the main event. He's the star celebrity. And is, is our life really about him? Is, is talking about him, and is that part of who we are? Is that part of our identity? And you can go on and on and on and on about it. In my marriage, we talk about Jesus every day. We don't just talk about him. We also talk to him, and we try to teach our children how to do that as well. And sometimes we try to... We try to get them to pray in front of us, too. And it's not like we've carved out prayer time. It's not right before we go to bed or anything like that. Sometimes it's really spontaneous. They're sitting at the dining table or they're doing some kind of homework or working on some art thing. Something comes up. We're like, hey, Jubilee, promise. We're going to pray. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. Pray for Daddy right now. And talk to Jesus. He's right here with us. And that's the thing. You know, it's like just as much as in your daily life, there are routine things like you get up at a certain time, you go to work or you go to school or you, you do different things at different times you know, throughout the day and, and it's, a lot of times our schedule is set. But even in the midst of that, what keeps us going is that there are unpredictable things. There are things that are out of routine. There are fresh new things happening. And the Holy Spirit keeps it fresh. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does to keep it fresh is that when it's about Jesus, he's always doing something fresh. He's always doing something new. And God wants to make each day for you of your faith life new and different. He wants you to know the, the infinite depths of God's grace and love. He wants you in that relationship. And the Holy Spirit does this so well when it's about Jesus. At the same time, 
What I noticed in my life, and I read this through the scriptures, is that there's a big difference between talking about Jesus in the flesh and talking about Jesus in the spirit. For instance, I've experienced so many, this, this so many, many times, and I've witnessed this in many other folks as well. You can pray the right prayers. You can cry out to God until your face is blue and pray the name of Jesus. You can even get the Christian lingo right. By his stripes I'm healed. And you say that phrase over and over again. But so often, even when we're getting our language right, we get our posture right, but we're still praying in the flesh. We're still, it's just a thing that we're just doing and operating out of our just our alone self. And we're not really availing ourselves to the activity of God into our lives. And we don't really see, we may see God working even when we do pray in the flesh, but we won't see the flow of God's spirit in our lives when, when we are not praying in the spirit, but just only in the flesh. We can believe in Jesus Christ through the power of your flesh. We can. Or we can believe in Jesus Christ through the power of the spirit. The difference is what you see in the lives of the apostles, right? When you look in the Gospels and you see the life of the apostles during Jesus' ministry, they were believing in Jesus in their flesh. They were trusting in their ability to believe in Jesus. That's why they failed so much. That's why they, tr they trusted. Peter would all, oftentimes declare these very powerful statements. And Jesus would commend him. This was revealed to you by my Father. But that's just in the flesh. He did not yet receive the Holy Spirit. The difference is what you see in the lives of the Wesley brothers, as I, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, about how John Wesley was so changed by his encounter of the Holy Spirit. He was doing every Christian thing. He was experiencing God in different ways. But there was a world of a difference after he encountered the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't just John, it was his younger brother Charles. In fact, there's this ongoing debate between the two of them, who, who, who encountered the Holy Spirit first. But according to the facts, May 21st, 1738, Charles Wesley at his friend's house was reading Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. And as he read Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the one where he says, I am crucified with Christ. It is not, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live is no longer in the flesh, but by faith in the Son of God who gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. He got so changed by that. He felt the touch of the Spirit in that moment. And then he knew, without a shadow of a doubt, he knew who he was in Christ. And he had the presence of God with him. It was three days later that John Wesley had the Alders Gate experience. But that happened when he was hearing a Bible study on Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. Romans and Galatians, what are they known for? Both letters of Paul boldly declare about what Jesus Christ has done and what it means for us to live by faith in him. Before this experience that John and Charles had, the Methodist movement was nearly a dead sect. They had started this little club in college called the Holy Club. Don't ever name your group Holy Club. <laughs> so you're, that's a death sentence for your spiritual group. Anyways. They call it the Holy Club. And it was small, but they were known for being very serious about their spiritual disciplines. And it just would not catch. And they were called the Methodists because they were so methodical about their practice, and people made fun of them and put them down for it. And it wasn't until years later, after their encounter with the Holy Spirit, nothing changed about what they were doing, but for some reason, this Methodist movement just ignited with power. Nothing changed about how they practiced their faith. They still did the means of grace of studying the scriptures, going to worship, taking communion, visiting the sick, the poor, the imprisoned. They did everything. They fasted uh, twice a week. They, 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 they did fellowship with other believers. They did every kind of means of grace. Nothing changed about their functioning, but something changed about what was motivating them and what was empowering them and how it affected other people around them. But one key thing that led to this was that both John and Charles got to a place in their life with God where they began to cry out in prayer 
saying, there's something wrong with my life with you, God. I don't sense the power. I don't sense the, the, the real, real change in my spirit. I'm constantly r- wrestling with the flesh. I don't see what I'm reading in the book of Acts. I don't see it. God, help me. What preceded this great transformation in John and Charles Wesley's life was prayer. Prayer that led them to that place where they were yielding themselves to God to intervene and do something. And today's Pentecost Sunday, and I want to I challenge you all with this question. Have you, have you experienced that stirring in your spirit, that heart strangely warmed? Not the goosebumps of something where you just feel, you know, like when you listen to some really amazing music, you get that goosebumps. That, don't, don't mistake that. We're talking about when, when the Holy Spirit is, is touching you so deep within, stirring up your spirit and, 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 and giving you revelation of, of, of what Christ has done and, and pouring out life into you in a fresh, new, and very different way. And just as John and Charles, they, their prayer preceded this Holy Spirit experience, the scriptures teach us that in the book of Acts chapter 1 that there were 120 people after Jesus' ascension would gather and, and they would pray. Acts chapter 1 tells us that they were devoting themselves to prayer. And in Acts chapter 2, they were all gathered in this one place. When suddenly on the day of Pentecost, a little before 9 a.m., there was the sound of a a mighty rushing wind. Sound. Sound always comes before visual, right? Uh, If you look at creation of uh, uh, the, the creation story, you know, God speaks, let there be light before the light actually happens. There's always the sound of God moving before there's the appearance of God showing. And after the mighty rushing wind, there's this visual of what fire seemed to enter into this room that they were in, and it began to split into tongues of fire that landed on everyone's heads, and then everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit. Church, the Pentecost story is not the 11 disciples, or well, including Matthew, the 12, the 12 apostles. That's not the story of the Pentecost. It was the 120. It It was the gathered church the first congregation, that entire gathering. So the Holy Spirit is not for a few. The Holy Spirit is for the whole church. Amen? The church, the, the church. if you are part of the church, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is for you. It's not reserved for the pastors or the lay leaders or, or, or specific individuals. The Holy Spirit has been, is a gift that God gives to us, the third person in the Trinity given to us to all the church, to every believer, upon everyone. And I love how it says, everyone was filled. And then everyone began to utter words as the Spirit enabled them. This is a little different than the, the kind of tongues that you read or see or hear about, uh, 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 you know, in the charismatic movement today, or even in the scriptures, they talk about angelic tongues. This is, this is not that tongues. This is a, the first set of tongues that the Spirit gave to the church was actual language. Actual language given to these people because on the day of Pentecost, there were Jews that were gathering from all the outlying nations speaking different languages, and they had come to celebrate the law that was given to the Jewish people. And they were coming in from all over the place and they began to see this first church praying and prophesying and speaking in those languages from the countries that they had come from. And it was, it it was, it it drew their interest. It caused them to, to to pique their interest. It caused them to, to want to see what in the world is going on. These Jewish folks who are Galileans, They're not from those other countries. They're speaking the language of where I just came from. It caused them to open up and hear the gospel. And Peter preaches this gospel. And that day, 3,000 people get saved. The Holy Spirit is first and foremost given, not so that we could experience power only. The Holy Spirit is given to us not only so that we could have just victory over sickness and illness and, and, and breakthrough in our lives, That's part of it. But did you know that the Holy Spirit is given to ignite the church with a mission? That's the most important, that's the primary function. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his disciples in Acts chapter 1-8. He said, you're going to receive power. Now before that, the disciples, Jesus is about to go up and the, the disciples say, Lord, are you going to restore Israel right now? 
See, th these guys, after Jesus died on the cross, resurrected and, and was about to ascend, they still think that it's about Israel. They think it's about the Jewish people. And, and Jesus, he says, you know what, you, you have no idea, and you don't need to know about that part, but I'll tell you this. What you do need to know is that the Holy Spirit's going to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power. And if you read that passage, there's a lot of and, 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 and. If you remember, um, and I was terrible at math in, 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 um, in, in high school, but is that logic, when you logic statements, the proof statements, the and statement means that both parts of the statement have to be true, right? So, so that, that's, the, that's the Greek phrasing here is that, and you will receive power, the Holy Spirit comes, and you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. You can't separate those two things. And so you will receive power, and when you receive it, you're going to be my witness. But what's a witness? We always jump to the conclusion that if you're a witness of Jesus Christ, that you're an evangelist. No, before that, you have to first see. A witness is somebody who saw an event. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to see Jesus. You're going to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So what, what, what Jesus is saying is when you receive power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to witness, you're going to see Jesus in Jerusalem, you're going to see Jesus in Judea, you're going to see Jesus in Samaria, and you're going to see Jesus through the ends of the earth. So receiving power through the Holy Spirit results in experiencing and witnessing Jesus Christ in action in the midst of all these places. Starting with Jerusalem, where you're most comfortable. Judea, where you are familiar, the area that you're familiar with. But also Samaria. And if you know the Israelite history, Samaria and Israel, they were at odds with each other. And Jesus is saying, you're, you're going to see Jesus in the midst of those you're uncomfortable with. You're going to see Jesus in the midst of the people that you don't want to be with. And then to the ends of the earth, you're going to see Jesus in the unfamiliar territories among the unfamiliar people. That, that's what's going to happen. You're going to see this power ignite in your life and you're going to observe and see Jesus come alive in these areas. And then you're going to talk about it. Because that's what a witness does. But first you've got to see it. And then you can talk about it. So it happened. On the day of Pentecost. It happened. It started to happen. They witnessed the Holy Spirit come upon them. They heard God's power. They saw God's power. And then they began to speak. And proclaim the gospel. So the goal of being spirit filled. Is not about becoming stronger and better and more capable as a Christian. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, the goal is the missional work of the church, to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to declare what Jesus has done. It's also for people not only to hear that declaration, but also to see for themselves. Just like the, the, the crowds that came and saw the church experiencing the Holy Spirit, they saw it. They experienced it too. And they believe the two so that now they can go back to their respective places and they can witness Jesus too. Have you had a stirring of the Holy Spirit? It's not just so that you could feel good. But have you had a stirring of the Holy Spirit that compels you to start seeing Jesus everywhere, especially the places you don't want to see him, but he's there revealing himself to you? Have you, have, you, have, you, have you seen that stirring within yourself? Maybe the parts of your life that you don't want to look at. But you know, he won't unless you invite him. He won't unless you pray and get into that place of prayer. You and I, we got we to put this to prayer of encountering the Holy Spirit and being filled with him. The word filled in the Greek means, means to, be, to be poured into to the utmost capacity. God wants to fill you up. He doesn't want to sprinkle the Holy Spirit on you. He wants to fill you up. And you know what? If you can identify with that, praise the Lord. But if this is a little foreign to you, amen, because this is where we can pray. Because the good news is that the story, I praise God for this. The story isn't the Holy Spirit came and only filled a few people. The story is he filled all people. The story is that all of us can experience that. But it requires for us 
You know, John and Charles, they were ordained Anglican ministers who had not experienced the Holy Spirit yet. It required them to humble themselves before God and say, you know what, forget my status, forget my, you know, uh, credentials, put it aside. I've been, you know, a a cradle Christian. You know, they grew up as Christians all their life, but it didn't matter. They were able to put that down and say, I still have yet to experience you, God. They knew the doctrines inside out, but they were able to put that aside and say, I still have yet to experience you, God. Please, God. It's like that song we sometimes sing, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. While on all others you're calling, do not pass me by. You call out to Jesus. Me too. I want that filling. We need that. Because Christianity ultimately is about being a witness of Jesus. Seeing Jesus alive in your life. And then telling people about it. That's what Jesus wants for us. And in the midst of that, you might do missions. These are all fruits. But before we do that, we get the foundation and the root right of being a witness of Jesus. Because being a witness of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit will get you to do missions. And you can help send our Youth Mexico mission team. You can reach deep into your finances and help fund the youth mission trip, encourage them. Do the same and support little lights. Not, not so that you know, they could be a light in D.C., but really to instill in the people of their communities that they serve to know that they each are all lights, little lights, shining the, the glorious love of God to the world around them. In the midst of being a witness, you might do that. First and foremost, being a witness of Jesus in your life. And in the midst of being a witness, you can say, I really want to build this church so that we can be better witnesses. In the midst of being a witness, you might host get-togethers in your home with your friends and family, members who are on the fence about uh, religion. And boy, I got to tell these people about Jesus I'm seeing these days. And in the midst of being a witness, you might turn to your, your spouse or your family member, your child, your grandchild, your grandparent, whomever you live with, and say, Let's talk about Jesus and what he's doing in my life. In the midst of being a witness, you might turn to your friends and share about the way that Jesus has been healing you or meeting you in whatever circumstance you're in. Being a Christian is about being a witness. Receiving the Holy Spirit gives you power to be a witness. The power that enables you to witness miraculous healings. The power that enables you to witness breakthrough in your life. The power that enables you to have good health and have good relationships. The power that enables you to be a witness that God's providing you financial freedom. The power that enables you to have Jesus-connected marriages and relationships and friendships. Being a Christian is about being a witness of God's might and power through Jesus Christ. I believe that this is the kind of Christianity God planned for us. I believe that the book of Acts is a narrative to help us understand what that Christian life and church life is supposed to look like. Before we get to all the stuff to do that we ask ourselves to stay, have I experienced the stirring of my soul? Have I experienced the touch of God's spirit in my life? Have you had your Pentecost? Let's uh, take a time to pray. I want to invite you to, to really think upon this. Um, to pray, to pray, and it's the Holy Spirit, I need you, I want to know you, I really want to know you, Holy Spirit, not as an idea, an entity, an abstract thought, but I really want to know you, I want to know who you are, I want to know you, I want to have you. Casting aside all the doctrines and all the lessons and all the theories and theologies, I want to know you, O Holy Spirit, that I might live in the vitality and the power of your strength, that I might be a witness of Jesus, that I might see you at work in my life. so that I can tell people about you in my life. 
so that I could express that witnessing in the way that I give, in the way that I serve, in the way that I speak. But God, make me a witness first. I invite you, O oh Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. Come move amongst us. Touch us by the power of your hand. That we're not living our faith life out of the flesh, but we would really live by the power of your spirit. We thank you, Lord.